Hi, Jamie. Hello. Hi. Hi. I was supposed to invite Nick too, right? Yeah, Nick as well. Yeah. Oh. You can start sharing your screen if you want. Um, yeah, I didn't do that. Share screen, window, this one. Yeah. Good. I can see Nick moving All around. Right. I can hear Nick. I can hear Excellent. Jamie. Excellent. So we're good to go. My audio works again. Your audio works. I can see the slides, or at least, yeah, the slides essentially. And uh, I'm going to give the floor to you, Jamie. Design patterns for parser combinators. And this is actually a functional pro. It is indeed. Right. Hi, Nick. Oh, um, hi, Jamie. I saw you having a bit of problems on the on the pull requests that you submitted uh, yesterday. Do you want to take a look? Yeah, I was trying to implement a parser combinator for uh, the parser uh, for the uh, really cool calculator on your app, but something went wrong. So um, let's have a look at GitHub and see what's going on. I guess people can yeah. follow along if they go to the link, right? Yeah, I posted it in the in the chat. We've got uh, a few visitors to this code review. Let's take out the issue first to remind ourselves what we're actually meant to be doing. Um, so I think your task was to write a parser, right, for this grammar here. Um, it's got you know the standard stuff: addition, subtraction, multiplication, unary negation, and uh, you know various other goodies, right? Right, exactly. Um, and I was trying to parse this into a simple AST, which is basically a bunch of constructors um, of type expression, which sort of do the usual thing. Right. Yeah, I think this is the one you mean, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, lots of little constructors, one single AST. Okay, that all looks good. Um, so should we take a look at the pull request then? And see right, exactly. On? If you look at the pull request there, you'll see that the um, CI engine, the continuous integration has failed and there's something wrong um, in the test and I can't quite work out what's happening. Okay, let's take a look and see what actually went wrong. Okay, so it looks like it timed out and on a very small example as well. Yeah, exactly, um, I'm quite surprised. Okay, let's have a look at your, your commit and see if we can figure out what's gone wrong. So why don't you talk me through what you've got here? Well, OK, so I'm just using parser combinators in the very ordinary way. So um, you can see that I'm parsing alphas. Um, that's going to say it's one of A to Z, um, lowercase or uppercase. Digits mm -hmm. are one of 0 to 9. Something that's alpha num is either alpha or a digit. Um, uh, never mind about numbers, but basically we're folding up um, a whole bunch of digits. Uh, an identifier is an alpha followed by many alphas. Um, and I guess the interesting thing here is really the expressions. So an expression is just an add constructor followed by an expression that we parse, followed by parsing a character plus, and then going on with a terminal. Similarly with subtraction, it's going to be sub expression and then the minus symbol and then term, term, a term. Or it's just a term if we have no um, add or sub, and then term is going to be mul with exactly the same stuff. So quite a straightforward application of parser combinators. I can't see what's going wrong. Yeah, uh, so you've modeled, you've modeled this exactly like the grammar. Um, they look very, very similar. That's kind of the problem you've got here. Um, actually, you're running into left recursion. Um, if you see here, uh, either of these cases are left recursive. Um, let me go to an example so I can show you a bit clearer what I mean by that. So what you're telling me is left recursion is somehow a problem with parser combinators? Yeah, for quite a lot of parser combinator libraries, it doesn't work out so well um, because they're implemented with recursive descent. So if you look at a, a, a parser like this, which is meant to represent this regex here, um, this is fine in the BNF sense. But if you think about how this gets evaluated, we try evaluating bad. And in order to do that, we evaluate bad immediately. And where do you go after that? Well, you evaluate bad again, and so on forever. It's never going to terminate. Oh, don't tell Andres about this. I was uh, I worked for him for years, and I didn't realize this kind of thing. Well, maybe you can refactor this grammar by having char a, char b, and then adding bads on the end of it or something? Yeah, so you can do some grammar refactoring techniques. I don't, uh, I don't like those for parser combinators because it kind of exposes implementation details um, in the grammar itself. Actually, I was thinking about this recently, and most parser combinator libraries support these chain combinators, um, and they basically abstract this repeated application of a parser to an operator. Let me just push that into the library, and I can show you what I mean. Okay, so, 
Let's go and have a look at them. That was a bit easier. Isn't it? Okay, so here's what I've added: two combinators, chain R1 and chain R1. Um, if you look at their types, they both take a parser that makes A's and uh, one that makes operators of A to A to A. And it will pass P op, P op, P op, P. And then uh, it will apply those operators um, bracketing either to the left or to the right. Ah, OK. So I see. So rather than just writing things out manually and then doing recursion, I can use these chain combinators. So let me hack up some code really quickly that will do the right thing. Right. I've pushed that up. If you should be able to find that in just a second. Looks like a... Here it comes. It's working its way oh. through the pipe. There it is. OK. Right. So tell me through what you've done here, then. Right. So I've removed the code on the left-hand side there, and I've replaced the recursive calls. So in the definition of expra, we don't need to make mention of expra itself anymore, because that's dealt with with the chain R combinator. And then I've uh, said that the leafs are called terms. So that's going to be the first parameter to the chain R. And then what we're doing for the operations is either an add or a sub. And so we just pass a, a char plus or a char, min char minus as appropriate. Great, yeah. And actually combining the operators in this way is slightly more efficient than the um, original representation you had. Uh, and it won't require any backtracking. Let's see if the um, if the issue is then fixed in the CI. Looks like it's uh, still churning its way through. I guess another 10 seconds to go or so. Hopefully. So the hope is that with parser combinators, we can basically replace common patterns uh, with things that we, that we see happening often. And um, that means we have less to think about, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so the advantage of parser combinators is that uh, they can be used to build parsers as building blocks, unlike something a bit more rigid like a parser generator. So we can build these combinators to manipulate things. Oh, it looks like actually the test did fail. Um, what? Let's have a look. OK, so we have a new example here, neg of num0. And it looks like the parser failed when it encountered a space. Have you actually handled um, spaces or letsing at all? Spaces? What? Oh, OK, so this is classic. So spaces weren't part of the original grammar, so I didn't encode them in any way whatsoever. I just sort of followed it blindly. Right. Um, I guess we'd need to somehow have some spaces put in everywhere inside the grammar, right? Yeah, actually, I've got an issue about this. Um, so yeah, you, you could you could uh, add in these, these white space combinators all around the parser to fix this. Um, but actually, I think that's quite intrusive to the overall structure, and it, it's quite cluttered as well. We want to keep it looking like the DNF, which actually doesn't have these things in. Um, actually, I think the cleanest way to do this for you would be to split this into a lexer and a parser and expose, uh, say, a token combinator and a fully combinator to sort of handle white space in a more uh, controlled manner. Ah, OK. I think I get the idea. So let me just patch that up as well. So we want some kind of combinators, and we want to there we go. All right, let's have a look at the code. I've just pushed. Oh, wow, it's up there. OK, so talk me through what you've done here, then. OK, so this is essentially the same. And I think what's interesting is going to be the white space um, combinator below. And that basically says that white space is, if you satisfy that, is that something is space, there's many of those. And we use that void combinator to make the types work. So the parser has type unit. And the real interesting part is that a lexeme is basically um, some parts of P followed by white space. And mm -hmm. what a token is, is we just try first, and then we do a lexeme. And that, the idea there is that you can roll back to the point before the token, so you parse the entire token or, or not at all. Um, and uh, the last bit is fully. And the idea here is that we've got this lexeme um, combinator, which gets rid of all trading white space, which means we just have to deal with the leading white space that might exist at the very beginning of the file just once. So we do that with this white space followed by P, followed by the end of file. And if you scroll down right. a bit. Um, uh, OK, so it's being used there. Exactly. Uh, that's right, yeah. And for the expressions, I guess it's just an easy case of wrapping everything around with token, because that's what that was designed for, right? OK, yeah, sure. Um, actually, I think you've you've done quite well here because you've been you've you've established a consistency about white spaces uh, where white space has passed, and that can be quite important. Um, so these all look great. I would think that the tests actually pass now. Um, that's actually, it looks like the eight has still failed again. What more failure? More failure. Okay, so right, this is a classic problem. So we've got a variable here that was generated by CookCheck. 
um, it's the variable negatex. So this is one variable on its own. And we expect negatex to come back, but it looks like the actual past term was negate of x. Wow, hang on, this is a bit uh, confusing. So negatex isn't some random word you made up, is it? It's been built into the actual unit tests here. Um, it's quick check can find this as a variable name, but it should be handled as a specific single token and your parser has broken it into two. Um, in other words, you need to ensure that when you pass the gate, you don't allow it to be a valid prefix of an actual identifier. Huh. Oh, I see. So the problem is that negate is actually a keyword rather than a token or an ardent. Right. Okay. And so somehow I need to deal with that. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, let me see if I can hack something up for this as well. Okay. It's a good thing um, uh, you're my PhD student because I don't think I'd be able to afford your services. <laughs> yeah, I charge uh, I charge a lot by now. Okay, uh, looks like that's gone through. Um, I'm really liking your commit messages, by the way. Very descriptive. Yeah, I think they're just an important part, part of what we do. Okay, so talk me through what you've got here. Okay, so what we have here is I've added this keyword combinator. So a keyword K is basically that's uh, string K not followed by anything alphanumeric because that's what determines the fact that it's a keyword. And then it's a simple case of replacing um, token with keyword in the actual grammar for the word negate. And hopefully that's going to be the last issue we need to deal with. Great, yeah. And it looks like you've also made sure that you've atomized it after doing that check, which is quite important. So that's good. Um, let's check on the CI if it's still... OK, it's still running. So actually, um, while we've been doing this, I've actually realized there's a bug in the pretty printer. So I'm just going to um, I'm going to push that through. And um, I can explain what's going on with that. Actually, it looks like our test did pass for that, which is oh, good. good. It did pass. Good. But there is this bug. So it turns out whoever implemented the pretty printer forgot to put brackets around uh, this parentheses node, which uh, uh, obviously is the right behavior. Don't quite understand. I'm seeing the word strong here. What's that? Oh, right. Yeah. Actually, um, there's two types of AST in this code base. As we saw earlier, you're working with the weak one. There's also this strong one here. Uh, the difference is that each of the grammar rules uh, is actually represented as its own data type here. And what that means is that it's a bit stricter about what things can appear where. And actually, the explicit introduction of parentheses means that it's really easy to pretty print with minimal brackets. Oh, I see. So this is basically following the BNF, but at the data type level much more closely. So it's a kind of much stricter version, a much stronger version of, of, um, of the data type. Um, yeah. It seems like that'd be quite useful for catching all sorts of errors that you might not think of. Yeah, and at the moment, we're just converting between the two whenever we need to. I mean, I would hope that it doesn't affect the CI, but it looks like it actually has. Um, so we've still got a problem with our parser then. Hmm. It looks like this time um, the test case is an add with a subtract on the left, but actually the result that we've been given back has the addition on the right. Remember, so the plus and subtract on the same level. So the test case here is where the data that we're trying to test has left associative things, but the parse is parsing as right associative? Exactly. But oh, we weird. fixed that earlier, right? Um, let's have a look at the, at the commit that did that. It was this one, right? Right, I fixed that already. See, even says so in the commit message, chain L. Chain L, but it looks like you're using chain R in the actual code. Oh, rookie error. So I should have used chain L instead, and that would have worked out just fine. It would have done. Although, actually, I mean, you could just fix it like this, but it's not really going to help. Anyone could make that mistake again. I think, actually, it would be really good to use that strong AST that we were talking about. And the problem is, is that the chain combinators don't have the right type for it. Right. So, yeah, it was not good enough that I can just swap in chain L and chain R. If only we had some kind of stronger types, then we'd be able to fix this error. But then I can't use chain L and chain R because the types won't fit, right? Exactly. But as it happens, I've actually been playing around with some uh, new versions of the chains that actually will help here. I'll just push them up and then we can take a look at how they differ. OK. OK, so they should be coming through any minute. There they are. So the key difference here is that instead of having A to A to A, they have B to A to B and A to B to B. 
Um, these look very familiar to, you know, classic fold R and fold L. And actually the Bs represent the associativity, Bs bind tighter to the left here for infix L and tighter to the right for infix R. Ah, right. Clearly we need strongly typed PRs. Well, in any case, this looks just like a fold left or fold right pattern, right? It is, it is. And actually these wrapping functions that get added as the first argument help to convert a terminal P into, you know, a K-like parameter for the fold. Okay, so I think I know how I can patch this up. So let me have one last go at this. Hmm. Okay, it's on its way. Hopefully. Get through those pipes. There it is. There we go. Magic of the internet, right? Okay, so tell me what you've done here then. Right, so I've replaced your weak AST with the strong AST, so that changes the data types a little bit. Um, and the key point is that I'm using infix L rather than chain R. And obviously the R was the bug, now it's an L. But the infix is making it work out type-wise. So it goes from an expert, which is going to make a parser expert, to a term, which is a parser term. And going mm -hmm. from an expert to term requires the of term constructor. And so that's yeah. what uh, is being fed in as the first parameter. And then going from term to negate needs of negate. And then going from negate um, all the way back up requires a parser, a, pa a parens. Well, that's for the atom, actually. Um, yeah. And hopefully that should, should fix all the issues we have, right? Yeah, this should fix the issues. Um, it looks like the CI is still running through. Um, I guess while we're waiting for that, we can think about whether there's anything else we can improve about this here and now. Um, it is it a little like bit annoying. Yeah. No, go on, go on. Well, I think I'm a little bit annoyed by the fact that um, this uh, looks quite close to the grammar, but there's a bit of clutter, right? There's this like token char and keyword negate and all this kind of right. stuff hanging around. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could kind of unify the token char, or I guess token dot string, with keywords um, and actually check whether the argument provided is a keyword in order to sort of uh, make things a bit more uniform. But you're right in that, you know, these keywords. Um, combinators still have to appear in the in the thing and it makes it look less like the grammar. Um, I don't have any solutions to that offhand. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Actually, I do have an idea. We could probably use overloaded strings here, couldn't we? Overloaded strings? I don't think I've heard of that. Ah, all right. They're just a GHC extension. That means that when you type in a string, what you get is basically uh, any type that you want, so long as you have a way of converting from a string representation to that type. And so in this case, we can basically um, farm out the job of getting the uh, right uh, tokens or, or keywords uh, just by doing some type inspection and letting classes do their work. So let me just do a patch view for that one. OK, and uh, while you're doing that, let's, uh, I'll check on this CI. Looks like it's all passing again. Uh, good. So we don't have a working parser. Now, hopefully, um, that patch has arrived. It has. It has. Um, so yeah, let me talk you through what you've got here. Right. So uh, now the keywords are all held inside this uh, list of strings called keys, which holds, in this case, just the single keyword called negate. And the interesting part is the is string instance, which is what the overloaded strings use to create new strings, uh, to create things from strings. And uh, right. if you take a string and it's an element of that keys list, then it's a keyword, and that's what we do on the right. Otherwise, we say it's a token, and we just use the same combinators that we had earlier. And if you scroll right. down to the grammar, um, uh, that just means that uh, everything gets cleaned up and everything becomes much simpler and neater. Oh, this is lovely, isn't it? So none of the, uh, the garbage sat around. It's just string literals, which is basically what the BNF grammar looked like. Exactly. Uh, well, with so many lessons that we've learned, I just wish there was a place where I could go to read about these different things when working with parser combinators. Actually, yeah. I mean, you've been pretty quick at coding this stuff up. But as we've been talking, I've been writing. And uh, it turns out that uh, I've already prepared a paper for us. Oh, wonderful. And it's been accepted yeah. at the Haskell Symposium. Nonetheless, yeah. Let's have a look. So, Great. Uh, I've uh, basically started with the same initial problem and parser that we had originally. And I've outlined, uh, as I've gone, the different problems that we've encountered, as well as what the various solutions are in you know quite bold boxes. Um, there's actually more than one pattern for some different solutions so they've been added and uh, there's even some goodies that we haven't talked about today but i guess those can wait for a future pr oh man i thought that parser combinators were useless but turns out they're actually really good for parsing with thanks very much yeah absolutely
Good. Well, I think that's all we have to talk about. So I guess I'll catch you later. Yeah, great. Thanks for um, thanks for your time here, and uh, we'll get this PR merged and ship our product. Don't forget to unlock the uh, the repo. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much for your interactive. Yeah, no problem. Presentation. Um, yeah, I'd just like to, to plug quickly uh, that I do intend for the repo to now be a place of, of future collaboration and things. Um, so people can feel free to visit the discussions and, uh, you know, share their own patterns or, you know, do a show and tell of whatever they want. Um, so I, I intend for it to be a little hub for Parser Combinator patterny related things. Yeah, thanks a lot. Great. Um, so are there any questions? So I see a, a question by uh, Tom Smeding. I'm going to show the question on stage and read it out. So this requires a list of keywords that must agree precisely with the list of keywords in the grammar and appears disconnected from locations in the grammar where the keywords appear. Could this perhaps be made more foolproof? Right, so I think the, the last pattern that we showed off there actually helps address this in part because um, you basically package all those keywords together and um, the strings that you use inside the actual parser get checked. Um, so you still have to list the, the keywords out from the original grammar, um, but you don't have to remember which parts of your parser need the keyword combinator versus the, the, the token of string, um, which helps a little bit, I think. Is this okay for you, uh, Tom? I saw a thumb. Oh, wait a minute. I probably have to invite him to this stage, otherwise he can't react. He says yes in the chat. Oh, he says yes in the chat. Then I can remove him from the stage again. Okay. Are there any other questions? Oh, I already see a question by Artem. Do you ever consider performance impact of various patterns, like rejecting some patterns on the basis of poor performance? Right. Um, so I guess, yeah, the, the ideal pattern is uh, is not only good, but keeps its performance. Um, performance is a bit of a relative term. The ones that we've done so far, the, the chains, for instance, they will help performance. Um, the, the Lexing ones can help performance depending on how they're used. Um, I think most of the patterns we've done don't impact performance too much, um, but actually it depends on the library. If you're uh, using some libraries uh, like my very own Parsley, a lot of any overhead that could be introduced has been eliminated at compile time anyway. So it kind of depends, but there will certainly be patterns that might um, sort of damage the, the performance, but uh, not in an asymptotic way. So it, it probably won't make it way worse um, on larger inputs, but it might just increase the constant factor. But you're always gaining something from it. I think um, your question sort of reminds me, so you're, you're talking about, you know, would we reject some patterns? Something that we wanted to do in the paper as well was actually talk about anti-patterns, so things that you don't want to do. Um, and so if you go and have a look there, then you'll see there are a few more things that we've said that, you know, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, because they, they tend to be, they look like solutions to start with, but they, they turn out to be bad things to do. Right. Thanks. Any other questions? So, so then I have a question, uh, maybe, as a, maybe a final one. So, I mean, there are quite a number of parser combinator libraries out there. I mean, and, and this is kind of focused on one particular implementation, but you also have monadic parser combinator and stuff like that. I mean, uh, are you going to develop versions for these other parser combinator libraries as well, or does it make sense at all? So the patterns that we've got in the paper um, so far are actually applicable to basically any library. Some aspects of them will um, not be required. So there are libraries without try, for instance. Um, so you can sort of just ignore try when you see it in the paper, but they're sort of widely applicable um, to everything. So I guess there are, 
patterns that are specific to some libraries that are, are going to be uncovered eventually. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're sort of widely applicable. The interesting one is uh, that the chains are something you don't see in Megaparsec, um, but they actually favor precedence combinators, which is something that the paper also describes. Um, so, you know, there's something for every library in there, I think. All right, and then uh, Noan has a question. Uh, he also needs <laughs> some help, it seems. <laughs> I am always available, just at me. <laughs> For money, I issue, right? <laughs> well, it depends on the project. I'm always willing to help open ah, okay. source, right? <laughs> Um, All right, I'll question. mark this as answer then. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a meta question, I guess, by Andreas, Andreas Klebinger. How often, if at all, did you practice this talk? He loved the delivery. Um, so I actually have a count of how many times you did it. I, I uh, think this is take four, isn't it? This is, uh, yeah, this is take four, basically, like the finalized thing. Well, we only started actually preparing together two days ago, um, so we had the we had the idea in the back of our head for a while, um, and I sorted out all the repo and the various Git patches. Um, turns out, archaic uh, ways of transmitting Git commits by email actually are useful for something in the modern day. Um, and then we actually got together and decided um, on what we were roughly going to say. Um, within the last couple of days. Every take is different. Every take is unique in its own special way. And the CI gets delayed or fast in different ways for each talk. So how do you ever know what it's going to be like? OK, so related to this, uh, Jeremy asked, how much of it was live and or canned video? or Everything that you saw here today was 100% live. And we were very pleased that GitHub didn't crash. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I wish we were sponsored. <laughs> yeah, I wish we could say that, you know, we asked GitHub to make sure that nothing went down, but we didn't. It could have all gone wrong. Uh, we did record yesterday's uh, last take just in case, but uh, turns out we did not need it. Great. All right. I'll mark this as answered. And. I don't see any more questions. So I want to thank the speakers again for their impressive performance and answering all our questions. I'll uh, kindly remove both of you now to introduce Bye. the next speaker. Bye, see ya. See ya.